welcome back to my channel. I'm Andrea M and this is Unsolved Down Under. On the 25th of June 1978, a vivacious 18-year-old girl left to dance at Newport Beach Surf Life Saving Club just after midnight. She was last seen walking to Baranjoey Road where she accepted a lift from a stranger and was never seen or heard from again. What happened to Trudy Adams on the highway to hell, Baron Joey Road? But before we delve into today's Unsolved Down Under, I'd like to take a moment to remind you to please like, share, comment, and consider subscribing if you've not done so already. I post real crime, missing persons, strange phenomena, scary stories and paranormal investigations here on my channel on a weekly basis. And if that sounds like your cup of tea, liking, subscribing, sharing and commenting help me out a ton in growing my channel and it costs you nothing. So if you could do that for me to help me out, that would be amazing and I would appreciate that so, so much. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's case. Trudy Adams was a bubbly blonde teenager in 1978 with the world at her feet. She was planning a trip to Bali and she had many friends and a happy home life with her parents Connie and Charles and her brother John. Trudy had even appeared in a surf movie made by a local filmmaker Steve Otten titled Highway One. Trudy Adams has been missing since the night of the 25th of June 1978. She was 18 years old and a business college student from Avalon on Sydney's northern beaches. She had long blonde hair, grey green eyes, a slim build and she was 162 centimetres tall. She was last seen wearing a bottle green floral blouse and a black jumper. Trudy left her home at 7pm to attend a party with friends and walked up Baron Joey Road. Baron Joey Road commences at the intersection with Palm, with Beach Road in Palm Beach and heads in a southerly direction as a two-lane single carriageway road through Bilgola Beach and Avalon Beach before it reaches Newport where it widens to a four-lane dual carriageway road and then to six lanes immediately afterwards to eventually terminate at the intersection with Pitwater Road in Mona Vale. The seemingly innocuous stretch of road would soon become notorious after Trudy's disappearance and darker truths that were also soon to emerge. So back to Trudy's movements on that fateful night in June of 1978. She had turned south to walk towards Newport. A motorist stopped to give her a lift to her friend Debbie's house and from here, Trudy and Debbie walked to the Newport Hotel, arriving at around 8.30 p.m. They stayed until closing time, which was around 10 p.m. Trudy was excited about her upcoming trip to Bali in six weeks' time. The girls travelled in a friend's car to the Newport Surf Life Saving Club. At 10.30 p.m., Trudy's boyfriend, or ex-boyfriend as it were at the time, Steve Norris, aged 22, arrived. Trudy left the club for about half an hour, her whereabouts unknown at this time, but returned at 11.30 p.m. During this time, Steve was upstairs at the club with friends. Shortly after midnight, Trudy ran outside, upset, telling no one where she was going. Steve saw her leave from the window of the club heading for Baron Joey Road, and he assumed that she would try and catch a lift as he had no car and there was no other way for Trudy to get home. Trudy did have a habit of accepting lifts from strangers at night and this was worrying Steve. And it was common for many people to hitch rides on the northern beaches at that time as there was little or no public transport available. And this was why Trudy had chosen to try to hitchhike home that night. It was also, um, it also came out later um, in an interview with Steve that she wasn't actually upset when she left the surf club as he would recount Trudy had been given an inoculation for her upcoming trip to Bali and her arm was sore, she wasn't feeling well and that was why she left the surf club. 
she simply wanted to go home because she wasn't feeling well. And before she had left for the night, she had in fact asked her mother would she wait up for her. So that will tell you that Trudy had every intention of returning to her family home that night. Steve would then follow Trudy out of the club, but as he was crossing the car park, Trudy had already reached the road and was getting into a Forney beige 1974-1976 Holden panel van with no side windows and no artwork, which had stopped to give her a lift and was already speeding up Barranjoey Road towards Palm Beach. Steve flagged down another car to follow her, but the panel van moved too quickly out of sight behind the Bilgola headland, travelling northward. Trudy lived only six minutes away, but she never arrived home. And as I've already said, she was never seen or heard from again. Steve hitched a ride to Trudy's house and waited there for her, but she never came home. Five days after Trudy disappeared, June 29th, a male person telephoned both Trudy's parents and the Monaval police saying, Trudy is dead. You will find her about halfway up Monaval Road. It was an accident. Police would go on to search a huge area, almost 400 square kilometres, including extensively along Monaval Road, but no trace of Trudy was found. It was Trudy's case that would go on to reveal the insidious secret Baron Joey Road had been keeping in its dark heart for at least eight years. In the months before Trudy disappeared, a total of eight girls reported they had been picked up hitchhiking on Baron Joey Road between Newport and Mona Vale, where they were all essayed at gunpoint. A ninth girl was abducted at gunpoint while waiting for a bus. The suspects were two men aged around 30 years, Caucasian in appearance, often wearing cheap plastic wigs, sunglasses and moustaches as a disguise. The victim's eyes were taped, they were handcuffed, then tortured and essayed after being driven into bushland within a 20 kilometre radius of where they were picked up. As Steve Norris recounted, I think the panel van would have been a HJ model, as the HQs had side windows. Two major suspects in relation to the abductions and sexual assaults would soon emerge, after victims began coming forward to police soon after Trudy's disappearance. According to journalists Ruby Jones and Neil Mercer investigating the case for the incredible ABC docuseries Baron Joey Road, which I watched all three episodes in one sitting and if you would like to support Ruby and Neil and the hard work they put into this case Baron Joey Road is available to watch on ABC iview and I will leave a link in the description box below so that you can go and watch it there is a lot more that comes out in the documentary that I'm not going to put in here so that you can go and take advantage of the work that Neil and Ruby have put into this case and they handled it with such care and such um, dignity and respect for Trudy Adams and her family and friends that it is worth a watch. So go to the link below. I'm not sure if you can watch it if you're overseas, maybe try your VPNs, but it is worth a watch. It's a very well put together documentary and they were so loving towards Trudy. It was very heartwarming to watch it as well as parts that will make your blood boil and parts that will make you want to grab the tissues but I can recommend it as a really interesting documentary to watch. The suspects abducted 14 girls all aged in their teens at gunpoint and forced them into the car. The victims were then taken to bushland forced onto a filthy mattress forced to undress and the victims were some of them as young as 14 years were repeatedly essayed while the men took photos with a Polaroid camera. They got the victims' addresses out of their purses, told them that they knew where they lived and made threats that they'd be killed if they told anyone what had happened. They would do the same thing over and over again. It was obviously something they nailed down as some sort of ritual they did together, Ms Jones would say during the documentary. 
Also quoting Ruby Jones, she would go on to say, it seemed like it was some sort of sick game, really. It was almost like sport. They drove around the roads of Avalon and Newport looking for prey. Miss Jones would also go on to say that the 14 essays were shocking and very similar and became progressively more violent leading up to the night of Trudy Adams' disappearance. Some of these victims identified a convicted drug dealer and sex offender called Neville Tween, also known as John Anderson, as one of the attackers. He had also been the prime suspect in Trudy's case, but he was never asked a single question about it until thousands until 2009. Disturbingly, Tween was picked up with false beards, guns and disguises and was jailed for a disturbing bushland sexual attack on a young male pot dealer who sold him a bag of weed which was mixed with grass. And I'm not going to go into that particular assault here on YouTube because it is honestly one of the most horrific things I've ever heard. If you want to find out more about this particular part of the case, it is included in Baron Joey Road, and I believe it is in episode three. So if you want to find out what happened to the, the young man in question, and I'm going to give a trigger warning now, it is bad. It's really bad. Viewer discretion is advised if you do go to watch Baron Joey Road, just be prepared for a lot of distressing content, but it is presented um, as professionally and as gently as they could. That's how I would put it. Tween, who died in jail in 2013, had always denied anything to do with Trudy Adams. When interviewed by police in 2009, as part of the cold case investigation, he said the accusations linking him to her disappearance were all speculation and there was no evidence to back them up. Members of another group from Sydney's West, known as the Roseland Lads, allegedly had spoken of their involvement in the infamous abduction. But again, they denied this upon further questioning. So there was a group of guys that used to like to hang around the Roselands Mall there in Sydney, known as the Roseland Lads. Several of them had been heard at parties, drunk, bravado on display, saying that they were responsible for the disappearance and murder of Trudy. However, that was proved to be false in later years. In an even darker twist to this already disturbing story, came reports from a former National Parks and Wildlife Ranger, and I am keeping his identity private for privacy reasons for him. He did go on to say he regularly heard what sounded like gunshots and saw strange lights appearing in the dense brush after dark. He would also go on to recount during the documentary of coming across a bone chilling discovery one afternoon on his regular patrol. He would be the one to find the stained mattress and the clothing left behind by the suspects, but that would not be the only thing he would find. Days after Trudy's disappearance, he would also come across what he could only describe as a freshly dug grave, a shovel, a pickaxe and a sport coat hanging over a tree branch. This would give him reason to assume that whoever had been responsible for this little piece of handiwork may still have been close by. Concerned not only by the site before him, but also for his own safety, he left the area and alerted the police. So this is also explored in the documentary Baron Joey Road and he actually does take the two reporters to the site and he shows them where he saw what he believed to be a freshly dug grave that was dug into the hillside there in the dirt and it's still there so that's very interesting indeed that that grave is still sitting there after all this time but Trudy's never been found So the hunt for Trudy Adams's whereabouts or her remains was at that time the largest in New South Wales history. And as I just said, however, sadly, almost 50 years later, 
no trace of Trudy has ever been found. As we've seen before in other mysterious cases of New South Wales in the 1970s, the drug trade and police corruption was running rampant and in Trudy's case this was no exception, leading to questions of whether Trudy had become involved in a drug mule deal gone bad. Speculation beginning with her up-and-coming trip to Bali. However, Miss Adams' childhood friends Leanne Weir and Anita Starkey told the documentary makers they categorically denied that she would ever have anything to do with drugs. Ms Jones and Mr Mercer came to the conclusion that the drug meal theory had been well and truly debunked. In the almost 50 years since her disappearance, Neville Tween has long been the prime suspect in Trudy's presumed murder. He was, however, never asked a single question about the case until 2009, despite being suspected of two murders in the 1980s and being charged with more than 100 crimes, many of which took place on the northern beaches. So why wasn't he questioned? According to Unravel, an ABC podcast about the disappearance of Trudy Adams, Neville Tween had close ties to Australian Federal Police Officer Mark Standen. While this relationship likely hadn't emerged in the late 1970s, when Trudy first went missing, the connection between the two was reportedly clear by the time of a 2008 police investigation into Trudy's case. When New South Wales Detective Jason McLeod started to look into a number of Northern Beaches crimes in 2008, he turned to the Crime Commission's top investigator, Mark Standen. He would go on to say, I provided Mark Standen with my investigation plan as to how I was intending to gather evidence against Tween, he went on to tell Unravel. McLeod says over the next few weeks, Standen seemed to be delaying any action into the case. It was then that McLeod claims he discovered that Standen's son, Matthew, had applied to the New South Wales Police Force using Neville Tween as a reference. However, both Mark Standen and his son, Matthew, deny this story. Standen only acknowledges that he simply knew Tween. Between 2008 and 2010, cold case detective Gavin McKeon reinvestigated Trudy Adams' case ahead of the 2011 coronial inquest into her disappearance. He says he has little doubt that Tween, who died in jail in 2013, as we already said, is responsible for Trudy's murder. Several women at the time reported attacks by a man who fit the description of Tween and after Tween moved to the New South Wales Central Coast, the attacks stopped. For journalist Ruby Jones, telling the story has been about shining a light on our justice system. Ruby would go on to say, I've always been interested in crime and also looking at violence against women. But more broadly for me, there's a sense that you want to know that if something bad happens to you, or to somebody you care about, that the systems are in place and the systems work, and the police will investigate properly, and if they don't, there will be repercussions. Ruby and Neil's investigation podcast Unravel, as I mentioned before, and its second season saw several women contact the podcast team, saying they also had survived similar attacks. Most did not report what happened at the time and have never come forward before. A woman called Michelle told Unravel she and a friend were hitchhiking on the northern beaches in 1974 when two men picked them up. They said they were going to pull over on the way to Newcastle and SAS. That's what they told us they were going to do, she said. And in the transcripts that I've read and the podcast and the show that I watched it is the R word that's used, so just be prepared for that if you are listening to the podcast or you're watching the, um, the documentary. They do use the R word. We are not allowed to say that word here on YouTube. That's why we say S-Aid and 
I think by now we all know what that means, but just be prepared to actually hear the word used if you're going to listen to the podcast or watch the documentary. Michelle said the men drove to the corner of Mona Vale Road, close to an area of bushland where many other women had been assayed before. When they reached the intersection, Michelle and her friend opened the car doors and escaped. We didn't do anything about it at the time because we certainly wouldn't have been allowed to hitchhike and we were probably wagging school, she said. The same year that Trudy disappeared, another woman named Karen Lagala was hitchhiking to a wine bar just a few kilometres south of where she vanished. The driver she hitchhiked with took her to an isolated patch of bushland and attempted to essay her. He grabbed me around the throat and pulled me back down on his knee and put his hand over my mouth, she said. I just thought that he was going to overpower me and then I would have been essayed, beaten and essayed. Karen Lagala says she was picked up by a man who attempted to assault her. But when the driver was distracted by a passerby, Karen also managed to escape. But she didn't report what happened either. Karen would go on to say, I didn't want to tell the police because I thought I would be in trouble, she said. Because I was hitchhiking and in those days, well, you were asking for it. Or that was the general consensus back then. And another thing that would come up during the, the, um, the documentary was when Trudy's friends were talking about her and what it was like for them in the days following Trudy's disappearance. And one of her friends actually worked at the local news agent. And, she, you know, she would have the women coming in to buy the paper and obviously they would see Trudy's story and they would be talking about it in front of her and they'd be saying, oh, you know, what a stupid girl, you know. She shouldn't have been hitchhiking. She was asking for trouble. Not realising that Trudy's best friend was the girl who was serving them at the news agent. So that would have been extremely hard for them to hear. But that was the general consensus back then. If you hitchhiked and you got into trouble, you're asking for it. Which is really not the way to think of it. Back then in the 1970s, for some reason, people thought it was safe to hitchhike. And we've explored that on this channel many a time. So I think, I don't think it's as prevalent as it used to be. But people do still do it. And I'm just going to remind everybody now from the bottom of my heart, please don't ever hitchhike. Two weeks after Trudy's disappearance, Northern Beach's resident Beth Glide said she was driven off the road by three cars in a location close to where many of the women were attacked. Beth, now 63, said she narrowly escaped by throwing her car into reverse and speeding away from the men. So if there were two men and one is so if there were two men and one is suspected to be Neville Tween, who was his accomplice? In the weeks after Trudy's disappearance in June of nineteen seventy eight, some women had identified Tween and an associate Ray Johnson to police. As Unravel had discovered four months later, Tween and Johnson were arrested in Sydney in possession of loaded handguns, wigs and false beards. And I think I did mention that before. It should have been a crucial clue, but it appears officers investigating Trudy and the assaults were not told this vital information. And we may be seeing a little bit of that police corruption at work here. If Tween did in fact have other friends in the police force, and I'm suspecting he did. Another associate of Tween was also investigated, although he ended up being found to be in Long Bay Jail at the time of Trudy's disappearance. His name was Leonard Evans, and he had allegedly boasted to a fellow inmate about committing the assaults with Mr Tween in Karingai Chase National Park giving details chillingly reminiscent of what happened to the 14 victims of Baron Joey Road. During the Baron Joey Road series, Ruby and Neil uncovered transcripts of evidence in Trudy's case. One quoting Evans as having told his cellmate, We used to have a good time, Tweeny and I. We'd get a girl in the car, 
get her in the back seat and threaten her to lay down at gunpoint. Then we'd slap the cuffs on her. A set of handcuffs was in fact found in the bush at Terry Hills, close to the abduction sites. But the question that kept springing into my mind was where in 1970s Australia would you acquire handcuffs? I mean, these days, I'm pretty sure you can just buy a pair of handcuffs off eBay or some dark web something or other. Like, you know, and there's like play handcuffs and stuff that, that people have for <laughs> other reasons. Or, you know, just handcuffs for like costume parties and things like that but back in 1970s australia you have to remember we didn't even have a cell phone back then there was no internet there was no cell phones this to my mind is of course back then because they didn't have any of that sort of thing and things just it wasn't easy to get stuff like that just anywhere in australia so that got my mind sort of ticking over with the friends in the police force aspect of the case and of tween. So I would have to think that back then it would mainly have been if you had a friend on the police force who had access to such things. So my next question is, did Mark Standen give the cuffs to tween or did he have more than one close friend in the police force? And considering he was never charged with Trudy's murder, leads me to believe, in my mind at least, this could also be true, considering he was never charged with committing any of the assaults on the other victims either, even after they had perfectly identified him as their attacker. He was eventually sent to prison over offences committed in Lismore in 1977 and the robbery of a munitions factory. Although police and other agencies are 99% sure Neville Tween is responsible for the murder of Trudy Adams. But without evidence to support these suspicions, Trudy's case, as I've already said, to this day remains unsolved. This is despite a harrowing tip-off made to the Unravel podcast. The source who wished to remain anonymous said a local criminal called Guido, also known as the Chicken Wire Man, suggested a location to him and that actually just sends shivers up my spine the chicken wire man it sounds like a really bad urban legend but this guy yeah he was a hundred percent real this guido which i'm doubting very much also was not his real name but i really hope the chicken wire man's maybe deceased as well by now because that actually scares the crap out of me just the thought of this guy the chicken wire man oh my god and when i tell you why he was called the chicken wire man you're gonna be like oh boy okay guido's nickname was allegedly derived from his methods of disposing of dead bodies he worked at a smash repair shop in brookvale north sydney with another convicted criminal called gary bat he was reported to have passed on information stating Trudy had been wrapped in chicken wire and lowered into a body of water somewhere in the Christmas Tree Hill region. However, no sign of Trudy's remains still have ever been found. The information has been passed along to the New South Wales Police Cold Case Unit. Trudy's mother, Connie, died at just 52 years of age, never knowing what happened to her daughter. With her husband, Charles, stating he believed Connie to have passed away from a broken heart. As of 2011, Trudy's father was still alive and still hoping for news to finally be able to put his daughter to rest. Trudy is also survived by her brother, John, and her many friends and loved ones, who were close to her before she so tragically disappeared. If you have any information as to the whereabouts of Trudy Adams, please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. The New South Wales Government has put up a $250,000 reward for anyone who provides information that leads to the arrest and or conviction of the persons responsible for Trudy's suspected death. You may, you may remain anonymous if you so wish. 
If you are too afraid to call the police, you can also make a report to the Unravel podcast or to Ruby Jones or Neil Mercer via the ABC. And this is where we leave the unsolved case of Trudy Adams. I truly hope in the near future, the mystery of her heartbreaking disappearance will be solved, allowing her friends and family to finally be able to lay her to rest in the manner that anyone deserves. As always, if this case has raised any issues for you, please refer to the following numbers to reach out for assistance. Thank you once again for watching and I will see you all in my next video. Please stay safe, always be aware of your surroundings, always take somebody with you, don't do anything alone, especially at night. And um, stay safe everybody, I love you all so, so much and I hope to see you back here very, very soon. Bye.